the Gulf Cooperation Council is no longer uh, perceived as a mystery in terms of being uh, animal, vegetable, or mineral, uh, but it is uh, a sub-regional organization established May 28, 1981 in Abu Dhabi. Uh, there with previous meetings in uh, Muscat and uh, Taif. Uh, consider the following to distinguish the GCC. Uh, David Bosch will uh, introduce our speakers that when uh, it was founded, unlike the, um, the European Union, which also was founded with half a dozen uh, countries, uh, there was no previous uh, institutional uh, economic a tie or relationship among the six countries as they had been in Europe with the coal and steel community dating from the late 1940s. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, just as the European Union was being founded, that was an emotional aspect among the European countries. The, their economies had been devastated. One country, disciplined, organized, uh, single-minded about a single issue, namely Nazi Germany, put 19 countries on their back. Only Great Britain, which at times seemed to be weak, wavering, and withdrawing, uh, withstood that onslaught. So there was an emotional aspect of despair and desperation and uh, palpable need, concern, legitimacy of interest, and foreign policy objective. There was no such experience, emotional, empirical, actual, or otherwise, that brought the six GCC countries together. Thirdly, the European Union uh, could proceed, did proceed, would proceed, because it knew it had its back covered. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization had been established in 1949. Uh, several years before, uh, guaranteeing the national sovereignty, the political independence, the territorial integrity of the uh, Western European countries. Uh, there no such uh, pact then or now has existed between a great power and the six uh, GCC uh, countries. And yet it has endured, uh, and its model has been the European Union, but the European Union is hardly bereft of blemish, and it would acknowledge that. And neither would the GCC countries uh, dodge the issue that uh, they have limitations, they have shortcomings, they have disappointments. But we're going to probe that today uh, with four specialists, uh, one from the U.S. Congressional Re uh, Research Service, uh, at the end, there will be uh, Ambassador Richard Schmira, who uh, not that long ago served as American ambassador to uh, Oman, is now the principal acting deputy uh, secretary of state for Near East Affairs. And in between, we will have uh, a business uh, person, uh, Michael Buonvino, uh, together uh, with Jason Bunting, who has a story to tell that uh, few Americans have followed regarding what the United States has finally, 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 italics on the word finally, gotten around to taking the GCC at its word and being serious about it and uh, trying to do more of the right things in the right way for the right reasons and the right results uh, regarding the GCC than ever before. David Bosch. Ladies and gentlemen, I think all I need to do is uh, introduce the speakers, and we'll just start very quickly uh, with Mr. Jason Bunton, who is the Director for Europe and the Middle East at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, known as the USTR. Uh, Mr. Anthony. Uh, after that, we'll have uh, Dr. Abdullah El Sheji, who is the Chairman. Uh, of the Department of Political Science of Kuwait University and an author of the book Kuwait's Ceaseless Quest for Survival in a Hostile Environment. Uh, that will be followed by Dr. Ken Katzman, a uh, specialist in Middle East Affairs uh, in Foreign Affairs Defense and Trade Division of the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress. And semi-last, we'll have Mr. Michael Unino, 
who is uh, from the Middle East operations of Hill International. And uh, Ambassador Richard Schmierer will get to clean the field. I don't know if that's the, the right term, but to, to finish it all off uh, before we have questions and answers. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Jason Bunton from the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here this afternoon. Realize we're getting toward the end of the day. Oh, I can certainly do that. Thanks. Uh, realize we're getting toward the end of the day, so I'll uh, try and, and not uh, talk too much, but um, did want to talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. government's efforts to promote trade and investment uh, with the GCC, the, the Gulf region as a whole. Um, the six countries comprising the GCC represent a very important trade and investment partner for the United States, offering a, a, an increasing opportunities for U.S. companies. Uh, the GCC had an estimated GDP of $1.5 trillion last year, uh, and a GDP per capita of almost $35,000. Uh, real GDP growth in the, in the GCC in 2012 was almost 6%, and is estimated to be around 4% through 2014. Uh, these six countries taken together uh, as a group would actually rank sixth as the uh, largest export market for the United States and sixth as uh, the largest supplier of imports uh, for the United States in 2012. Uh, total goods trade between the United States and the GCC countries in 2012 amounted to $124 billion with $50 billion in exports and $74 billion in imports from the region. Uh, therefore, it's not surprising that the GCC has become a, a priority for the U.S. government uh, as a whole and an uh, increased focus of U.S. governments, uh, the U.S. government efforts in the region, uh, including as part of President Obama's National Export Initiative. Um, in our efforts to improve U.S. economic relations with these countries, uh, the United States Trade Representative, the U.S. Department of Commerce, Department of State, and, and others uh, in the interagency have been working to develop opportunities to address GCC-wide issues uh, in a single forum uh, to try and address issues that U.S. companies, uh, concerns, issues, et cetera, that they've raised to our attention, and also to try and increase integration between uh, or among and between the region. Um, as the GCC has evolved over the years, uh, to develop its own unified or common legislation or other common approaches in areas such as standards, intellectual property, uh, customs, etc., uh, the U.S. government's approach has evolved as well. Um, and since a number of issues of interest and concern to U.S. companies have gradually shifted from member state, the individual member states, uh, to GCC competence, uh, we've sought to develop a, a structured framework for discussion of these types of issues with the GCC as a whole. So, to that end, after 18 months of negotiation uh, in 2010, or starting in 2010, uh, last September uh, in New York City on the margins of the UN General Assembly, we signed the Framework Agreement for Trade, Economic, Investment, and Technical Cooperation uh, with GCC officials, uh, led by the GCC Secretary General and the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs from Saudi Arabia as the chair of the GCC at that time. Um, similar to agreements that we have with the individual member states, uh, what we call TIFAs, Trade Investment Framework Agreements, um, the, this new G US GCC agreement, the Framework Agreement for Trade, Economic Investment, and Technical Cooperation, I have to come up with a short acronym for that, uh, establishes a joint committee that will meet regularly, again, to discuss a, a range of trade investment issues, including those that, that US companies come to us quite regularly about. Um, and this, the committee will provide a forum uh, to deal with issues that we haven't yet been able to deal with through our individual discussions or our discussions with the individual member states. Um, and one of the prime objectives of this agreement and our discussions in the forum uh, are to develop uh, or to, to start exploratory discussions on more comprehensive reduction or elimination of barriers to trade and investment. So we have our work cut out for us. Um, and, and is the first step in that process, 
Uh, U.S. and GCC delegations held uh, our first meeting under the agreement uh, in early June in Riyadh, uh, discussed a range of, of key trade and investment issues, including customs, intellectual property, standards, uh, legal harmonization, WTO initiatives, uh, food imports, etc., um, and built on some of our previous dialogues with the GC Secretariat and some of the GCC institutions, such as the GCC Patent Office, the Gulf Standards Organization, etc. And now we're working amongst us to develop an action plan for future activities under this agreement. Um, uh, one thing I should note is that uh, we don't intend for this agreement to replace our engagement with the individual member states. Uh, it's meant to supplement and build upon that engagement. Um, as I mentioned, we do have uh, individual TIFAs with all six countries. Uh, they're most active with uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE. Um, we also have free trade agreements with Bahrain and Oman. Um, and over the years, we've used the joint committees or the councils created by those agreements to discuss a broad range of issues, some of which I've mentioned, uh, but also including transparency in rulemaking, government procurement, um, again, standards, and, and a whole range of issues that U.S. companies and companies in the region uh, raise of, of interest or concern. And, and that's actually uh, one of the... I guess primary benefits or primary objectives of these types of agreements is to provide an opportunity uh, to work with the private sectors in both regions uh, to, to develop uh, initiatives to try and address bilateral trade and investment uh, issues or concerns and remove any types of impediments. Um, so for example, last September we had our last uh, free trade agreement uh, uh, council, I guess it's called, uh, meeting in Oman, discussed a range of issues, and we're now planning to have our next uh, TIFA uh, council meeting here in Washington with uh, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia and, and a range of, of officials from Riyadh. Um, on, on sort of a, a broader trade investment front, um, with events in North Africa starting uh, in early 2011, um, it's become more apparent that uh, we share common interests with the GCC and others in having uh, economies in that region characterized by inclusive growth and job creation. Uh, so we've been working with those countries uh, to, to develop initiatives that might assist in that process. Um, we've started to develop uh, initiatives regarding regulatory transparency, uh, on investment, supporting SMEs, um, trying to create a regulatory environment at the border to, to facilitate trade, so-called trade facilitation, um, and, and a range of other issues. And as we've consulted with other countries in the region, we've realized that these aren't just U.S. Uh, interests or, or initiatives that they really are, or there really is broader support, uh, including amongst the GCC countries, and so we continue to work uh, work on those types of initiatives. Um, one forum that we've been working through or on these types of, of uh, issues is through the, the Deauville partnership under the G8. Uh, it started uh, when France had the, uh, uh, the chair of the G8. Um, and we've been working since 2010 under that uh, partnership to support policies in this region that support increased trade and investment. Uh, notably, in April 2012 at the Dead Sea, uh, the United States and, and the other members of the Deauville Partnership and the GCC countries jointly signed on to an open investment declaration um, and undertook to support a range of other measures uh, to fil facilitate trade investment in the region. Uh, so just very briefly, uh, give you an idea of the U.S. government and the administration's efforts to, uh, to increase trade investment with the region, our integration with the region, um, and whether it's a bilateral, regional, or even broader regional focus, uh, it's pretty clear that we need to work with the GCC to expand our relationship into a more collaborative and multifaceted relationship. Thank you very much. Well, the next speaker uh, that we have is uh, Dr. Abdullah El Sheji, the chairman from, of political science from Kuwait University and author. Dr. El Sheji. Thank you. How much do I have? About 10 or 12 minutes. OK. 
Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. After a long day, uh, thank you, John, for the invitation. And this is uh, my third year in a row for coming uh, to this wonderful and uh, I think one of the best conferences in uh, Washington to discuss the bilateral Arab-U.S. relations. Uh, my talk today is about the GCC uh, perception, or what I call it, the trust deficit between the GCC and the United States, the uh, important ally and patron and guarantor of security for the Gulf countries. And after uh, Prince Turki Al Faisal's speech that uh, was very eloquent and pointed with a lot of uh, important messages, I think I'll build up on that and maybe elaborate a bit more as an academic and professor who follows the United States uh, policy very closely and who is interested in peace, tranquility, stability, and security for our vital region in the world, not only for us, but for the rest of the world. Unfortunately, lately there has been a lot of uh, worries from the region. Things are not well between the United States and its Gulf allies at this stage, unfortunately. Although that does not mean that we are, as I said yesterday at CSIS, we're getting a divorce or we're having a second wife here. It's too early for that, but things but things are really getting uh, uh, to a level that the Saudis, for instance, who are the major country in our block of the six countries that form the GCC, are fuming <coughs> and are sending direct messages. The last message, uh, message was today, not from uh, Prince Turki Al Faisal, but from his cousin, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, who was quoted by Reuters according to Western sources that Saudi Arabia, uh, the kingdom will make shift in relations with the United States in protest over its failed to act effectively and failure over the Palestinian crisis, over Syria, and its overtures <coughs> over Iran. So this is serious stuff. And what we, from, what we heard also from Prince Turkey has to be really taken seriously, and uh, the United States has to probably, with the new administration, and I see from the State Department, uh, a lot of newcomers at the State Department. There has to be more appreciation and understanding for the importance and significance of United States, uh, of the GCC countries, and the role we play in that part of the world for the stability, not only and for security of the energy, uh, supplies and the energy market in the world, but also for the stability and security of that region. I'm here, um, I want to remind the, the, the audience here with what former ambassador to Kuwait, Richard LeBaron, and he's now an, uh, a visiting scholar at the Athletic Council, Rafiq Hariri Center in the Athletic Council. He wrote a very uh, significant or important piece of uh, work uh, a few months ago argues, and that's from an American uh, ambassador who worked in the region. The US, the GCC, uh, the GCC countries see the United States as necessary but unpredictable partner. GCC chave at being asked constantly to be the ATM for projects devised in Washington. Some GCC officials are convinced that the US is na naive but the intentions of, uh, regarding its relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood. If you take all of this, if you take the latest development regarding especially the overtures with Iran, regarding the Rouhani sweet talking uh, and the security at the United Nations uh, General Assembly, United States embracing or the phone call uh, that was made by President uh, Obama to President Rouhani, that was depicted in Iran and in the what, what's called in the Arab world the uh, uh, resistance axis 
as a, a caving in of the Americans to the Iranians, and it was depicted as victory, that really tells us that there, is, there has to be a lot of work done by the Americans to convince the GCC states that a deal won't be done without taking under consideration their demands, their security, their needs, and it's not going to be they want, the deal won't sacrifice the, 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 the interest, the integral interest of the GCC country. What we see is that the Gulf is being shut out of that, these negotiations. What is the end result of these negotiations? And limiting it, as I said yesterday in my talk, limiting it between the United States as for, from what we see to the nuclear issue, which I know it's very significant and important from the United States perspective, without taking it as a holistic approach and fully integrated approach to address all the shenanigans and all the meddling that the Iranians have been doing in our region from undermining the security and stability of the GCC countries, spying cells, fomenting sectarianism, and what have you, I think uh, will not really allay the fears of the GCC countries regarding where this overture is going. The litany of uh, complaints, not only over, over that issue, is that uh, what we see from a GCC perspective regarding the United States vis-a-vis -a, -vis a host of issues of major significance to both the United States and the GCC regarding, for instance, U.S. policy over Egypt with the wavering and with the uh, letting go of Hosni Mubarak and then supporting or siding with Morsi and then cutting off aid from Morsi and lecturing uh, f from, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the coup that took place in Egypt, the military uh, establishment now in Egypt, cutting off aid and lecturing Egypt over uh, meeting the deadlines for transferring the country into uh, the, uh, the, on the de democratic path, what we see from United States policy vis-a-vis -vis Bahrain, uh, Iraq, Yemen, and of course Syria. That is the open wound that pits United States allies on one side and the Iranians and the other access, uh, uh, resistance access on the other side. On top of that, last year the GCC countries were extremely puzzled and worried about the United States' new strategy pivoting towards Asia. And what does that mean? And does that mean downgrading the region, the Middle East as a whole, and also the Gulf countries? Also, what, what, what we have seen regarding the United States now has become, as of this month, the number one oil-producing country because of the shale energy and because of fracking, the United States has become now the number one oil producing country in the world overtaking Russia, while at the same time, as somebody said this morning, China has replaced the United States as the number one oil importing country with a lot of significance for us in the Gulf, who, who we have been dealing with the East, with East Asia for, for the last decade, knowing that East Asia will be the number one oil market in the world, and, and does that mean that we're going to uh, witness in the few coming years a more internationalization of Gulf security with the presence of probably down the road a few years from now of the Chinese naval forces, the Indian naval forces, and what have you. Also, what was shocking for United States allies to see is the dysfunctional politics in Washington. The budget cuts, sequestration before that, budget cuts, and shutting down the government. What kind of message are you sending from this town to the rest of the world, especially your allies, whose their economy and their investments is tied up in this country? That is a major worry from an economic point of view from, from United States allies, especially in the Gulf countries, where most of our sovereign wealth funds is being invested in this country and in this economy. You're not getting your act together, and that's really sending uh, clarion signals that something is wrong in Washington. And as President Obama said, Americans are fed up with Washington. And he is right, I think. 
the, uh, the wavering over Syria is of a major concern for us as United States allies in the region, dependent allies that we don't cost United States a penny, unlike other allies that you have. What we saw after the build-up, the military build-up by the United States and then the wavering and the U-turn and going to the US Congress for authorization, although as a student of United States uh, government and I teach United States, uh, US politics and I studied at the University of Texas also and I taught American students, US government class there, you know, the US president, according to the Constitution and according to the War Powers Act of 1973, has the authorization to launch military action against adversaries, and he will inform the Congress within 48 hours of that military action. And then he has 60 days to get congressional approval, and if the Congress said no, then he has 30 more days to pull out the last American troop from that region. So that wavering by this administration, by President Obama, sent really chilling signals for its allies not only in the Gulf, even in South Korea, that you can get away with whatever you, any, any red line will be put by US president. And this is something that needs to really to be looked at by Washington, how the United States allies look, look at United States wavering regarding Syria. And not only that, but letting Assad off the hook and keeping him in power and uh, Assad equipped sarcastically when uh, the uh, Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons won the uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize that I should have won it myself. Now, the, 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 ex, the, United, the, the, the anti United States access in the region, the anti uh, uh, United States allies access, mainly Hezbollah, uh, Syria, Iran, feel that they are emboldened. And Iran, if, uh, if I'll, I'll tell you this, if it weren't for the biting sa uh, sanctions, they wouldn't have even entertained the idea of sitting down and talking with the great Satan. Because the reason that reason for the presence of the Iranian regime is to have the boogeyman United States, the great Satan, as the rallying uh, force to try to, to get the, the legitimacy to the regime. So there is a lot of uh, action going on here. There is a lot of complaints that uh, we are witnessing in the, in the GCC states. Uh, there are a lot of talks about United States isolationism, new isolationism. And that was disheartening for us, and especially for me. I'm following, I'm reading articles after articles by pundits. And even the, the, the discussion in the United States Congress by many congressmen as if they are completely oblivious about United States interests in the rest of the world. I know all politics is local. And I know all the issues here are very significant. But still, you are, the United States is still the number one power in the world, undisputed power, regardless of the budget problems, the government shutdown, and the bickering and fighting with the Tea Party and Ted Cruz and the others. <laughs> but still, there is a world to be looked after. There are interests to be looked after. There are allies that are worried about the dysfunctional politics and the messages, the, 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 the unbelievable messages that we are receiving. When you read, for instance, uh, Foreign Policy Starts at Home by Richard Haas, the case for putting America's house in order. We don't have a problem with that. But also you have to look also at foreign policy made also for your allies and to defend them to stand with them, and also to deter your enemies and their enemies at the same time. Simon Black wrote, uh, wrote it's official. The US Suez moment has arrived. And you know what does that mean? The retreating and retrenchment from the region. James Clad and Robert Manning write in the national interest, is this America's East Suez moment? Barry Posen, professor of political science and director of security studies program at MIT, writes in Foreign Affairs, pull back the case for less activist foreign policy. 
Roger Cohen wrote last September in the New York Times, anchorless word, and the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry warned on the impact of the shutdown of the U.S. federal government and its impact on U.S. foreign policy. U.S. President Obama canceled for the third time his visit to the largest Muslim country, Indonesia, the most populous Muslim country and the fourth most populous country in the world after the United States, and scrapped his visit to Asia, missing the APEC annual summit. Richard Hyderian, a legislative foreign policy advisor in Manila, Philippines, an ally of the United States, not in the Gulf, in the New York Times complained on behalf of many U.S. allies. When Robin Wright evoked the conspiracy theory in the Arab world, and in particular in the Gulf, with her provocative column in the New York Times last September 28, imagining a remapped Middle East on how five countries in the Middle East become 14, including splitting up Saudi Arabia into five separate countries, this, the, without dwelling into the strategic divergence over Iran, Syria, Egypt, and the Middle East peace process between the GCC states and the U.S., then all of these divergences, which are more divergences now, unfortunately, we have more divergent issues without looking eye to eye to these issues than convergence issues. Uh, then all of these divergences are bound to force questions on, by both the leadership, intellectuals, and in many circles on how can we, the United States be a reliable partner when President Obama can't even get his own house in order. Clearly, there is something wrong between the, in the relationship and needs to be addressed, re-evaluated, and revisited. Then I talk about the isolationism. I don't know, my, my time maybe is kind of running out, but uh, I just want to conclude by uh, stating the following. The trust deficit that is now growing between the two allies, the United States on one hand and the GCC the trusted allies, this trust deficit needs to be addressed head on between the two allies because there has been a plethora of literature lately by GCC personalities regarding even invoking conspiracy theory by United States to undermine and weaken some GCC and other Arab countries. Uh, the verdict is out. The U.S. needs really to be addressed. I think the United States needs to talk to the GCC countries in a very frank and open manner. Secretary of State tried to allay the fear quoted today by Reuters that he informed Prince Saud al-Faisal, uh, the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, about the uh, the end game or, or, the, or the ongoing uh, overtures and rapprochement with, uh, with Iran. Uh, but that's not enough. I think we have really to sit down. Uh, I welcome the, the forum, the strategic forum that was established between the GCC countries and the United States last uh, March, uh, March 2012, 2012 in Riyadh, and they held three meetings now, one in Riyadh and two in New York. The last one was during the United Nations uh, General Assembly last month in New York. Uh, this forum needs really to be the launching pad, uh, the launching pad for a better relationship, for a frank relationship, for the United States to allay the fears of its uh, of its uh, countries. The Saudis send a very clarion message, whether today by Prince uh, Turkey, uh, by Prince Bandar even today, and by Saudi Arabia opting not to take its coveted seat for two years at the security. Uh, not, as a non-member uh, at the Security Council in, in the United Nations. The GCC countries mainly support the Saudi position in showing their frustration uh, about the lack of action and active action by the United States. And I think the message has to be repeated in this, in this town that we are a trusted allies but we do not see eye to eye at this stage with the United States. And this is unfortunate because we have a lot of in common, we have a lot of interests in common, we have a mutual interest, but unfortunately they are being squandered by bad politics. Thank you. Thank you to the National Council again for having me as a speaker. Uh, I've been here quite a few times in a row. I have a few more times until uh, 
I take up surfing and yoga. But uh, <clears throat> still working in Washington, so I'll be here for a while, but longer anyway. Uh, so I just wanted to give a, an overview of why the US and the GCC actually as a counterpoint to the esteemed Dr. Sheji, who's my good friend for many years, why there will not be a divorce anytime soon. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the US and the GCC have a very long history. Um, before the Shah of Iran fell, you know, I mean, the GCC states, although they're now seen as, you know, very close U.S. allies and even to some extent uh, in, a, in a tacit alliance with Israel, uh, the, these, these, are, these are Arab states. Uh, they supported, uh, you know, the Arab side in the 1973 war, the 67 Arab-Israeli war, even though their foreign policies were uh, rudimentary and not the governments uh, were not... Uh, <clears throat> that powerful. They were just becoming uh, countries of their own, gaining independence, many of them, uh, except for Saudi Arabia, of course. Um, so before the Shah of Iran fell, you know, there was not much of a U.S. relationship with the GCC. Uh, the U.S. obviously had close relations with the Shah of Iran. He was a bulwark against communism. He was completely dissociated from the Arab-Israeli dispute. Uh, as much of the Iranian people are, the government is very much trying to uh, prevent any settlement of that situation, but the people of Iran uh, really uh, do not take an active interest in the Arab-Israeli dispute to any great degree. Um, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, was obviously a, a U.S. ally, but Saudi Arabia concluded that it was in, in its interest to be in an alliance with the United States. Uh, the kingdom felt itself in, the, as I say, 60s and 70s as threatened by Nasserite, revolutionary, Marxist, and communist movements, and the United States was uh, against that. So the Saudi kingdom felt that uh, they could put aside the issue of the U.S. alliance with Israel and justify the alliance with the United States. The fall of the Shah brought substantial change, and the Iran-Iraq war heated up in the mid-'80s. And that forced the GCC really to conclude, who do you want to be aligned with? Uh, the smaller GCC, the, all the GCC countries face the exact same threat from the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, the new revolutionary regime, that the United States did in terms of terrorism, etc. <laughs> Let's, let's not forget, uh, you know, in the mid-'80s, Iranian pilgrims did the Hajj in Saudi Arabia and went on large demonstrations and riots that unsettled the kingdom. Uh, Saudi Arabia's embassy in Tehran was attacked. In 1983, pro-Khomeini Iraqi Shiite groups attacked the U.S. and French embassies in Kuwait City. Uh, and bombed the emir of Kuwait's motorcade in May 1985 and, and actually injured him slightly. Uh, Bahrain accused uh, the Islamic Republic of supporting, fomenting unrest and actually a coup attempt in uh, 1981. Then there were Iran's tactics in the, in the so-called tanker war of the mid-80s where Iran was launching missiles on Kuwaiti oil loading facilities. This brought Kuwait into an alliance with the United States for the first time ever. Um, <clears throat> Prior to this time, the U.S. relations with most of the Gulf states were very, very tenuous, very not, not really close at all. Kuwait particularly, UAE, not much of a relationship, Qatar, uh, very, very rudimentary relations. Obviously, we had the alliance with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We had the naval presence in uh, Bahrain and Oman. Uh, the U.S. was just starting to forge an alliance with Oman. Uh, with the facilities access agreements of April 1980. So Iran's tactics in the tanker wars, I said firing on, on, on naval, on the Kuwaiti oil loading facilities. Um, Saudi air forces with apparent help from the United States fended off an Iranian revolutionary guard flotilla that was sailing uh, 200, something like 200 boats, uh, Iranian revolutionary guard boats sailing toward the Saudi coast, and the U.S. Uh, cooperated with the Saudis, and the Saudi Air Force drove the flotilla off. So the Gulf states were realizing that uh, they could trust, they, they were all backing Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war, uh, and, uh, you know, 
<clears throat> with the, uh, so this was, this was where they were aligned. Then Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August 1990, as we all know. At that point, the GCC states realized they could trust neither Iraq nor Iran. So the, the GCC states were without anybody to trust in the region itself. And at that point, the GCC states concluded they needed a solid, permanent, strategic alliance uh, with the United States. They could not rely on balancing Iran and Iraq. They could not rely on tilting. That had proved a failure. The United States earned their respect, their confidence, their trust by sending 500,000 500, forces to expel Saddam Hussein from Kuwait and leaving a substantial force in the Gulf thereafter. Uh, the GCC states then, as I said, decided they needed the strategic alliance, sorry, and uh, <clears throat> they decided to forego their concerns about sovereignty, about US troops on Arab territory, Islamic territory, and they decided to sign defense cooperation, formal defense cooperation agreements with the United States. Formal agreements were signed with Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, and UAE. They remain in force. The facilities access agreements that were signed with Oman in 1980 remained in force. Saudi Arabia, a little more sensitive about Islamic sentiment, hesitant to sign a formal pact, but continued informal uh, memorandum of understanding uh, informally. U.S. forces remained in the Gulf to help contain Saddam Hussein uh, through air operations uh, such as Operation Southern Watch, which was run out of Saudi Arabia. All of the Gulf states hosted U.S. troops in the September 11 effort and post-September 11 effort in Afghanistan, as well as Operation Iraqi Freedom to oust uh, Saddam Hussein, even though the publics in the Gulf did not necessarily support the invasion of Iraq. Operation Iraqi Freedom used, uh, involved the use of U.S. prepositioned armor, tanks, that were prepositioned in Kuwait and Qatar under these defense packs. Uh, even with the U.S. Uh, involvement in Iraq ended, the mission in Afghanistan closing down, the U.S. relationship with the Gulf states is as pivotal as ever. And it's now heavily focused on the Iran issue. Iraq no longer is a strategic threat to the region. It has no WMD programs. Its military cannot project power outside of Iraq. It's pretty much got its hands full keeping security inside Iraq. Um, and, as ex and accordingly, the U.S. GCC defense relationship has been rebalanced to focus mainly on uh, naval, air, assets, and missile defense cooperation. Uh, again, there is not, uh, the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran is not really a ground invasion threat. It does not have a large ground force, uh, but it does have missiles, it does have air assets, and uh, this is the threat. As I said, the defense pacts are still operative. There's about four to 5,000 U.S. military personnel in each of Bahrain, Qatar, and UAE, almost exclusively Air Force, Navy, and Marines. There's about 14,000 U.S. troops in Kuwait, including Army ground combat unions, units. Uh, mainly as a signal, you know, showing the U.S. alliance with um, Iraq, although you know, it's not that large a force and it's certainly smaller than the force that was in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein was in power. Um, <clears throat> there are in the low hundreds of US personnel in Saudi Arabia and Oman with troop levels in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia down from 6,000 that were there during the 1990s. Very much an emphasis now on missile defense. Uh, for two decades, the US has been trying to enlist the Gulf states in establishing an integrated missile defense network. Two of the Gulf states, UAE and Qatar, have bought the THAAD, the Theater High Altitude Air Defense, the most sophisticated uh, missile defense system we se sell abroad. So there is progress on that vision. The concentration on air and naval assets also supports other US objectives in the Gulf, including anti-piracy, anti-smuggling, counter-proliferation, and anti-terrorism operations. Many of these are naval operations and run out of the naval headquarters uh, in Bahrain. To conclude, it's probably a safe conclusion, I think, that the US GCC Defense Alliance will persist, broaden, and continue to shift focus 
<clears throat> One complication, though, is the growing perception in the GCC states, and this builds on what Dr. Shoji was saying, and that the U.S. is somehow now hesitant to become involved militarily in various conflicts in the, in the region. <clears throat> the Syria conflict stands, uh, obviously, as an example. The potential U.S.-Iran rapprochement has shaken the GCC state confidence in the U.S. willingness to confront Iran. However, again, the GCC states have no easy or ready alternatives, uh, and there may be complaints, as Sheji mentioned, but uh, <clears throat> there's not really a, an easy way for the GCC states to do anything other than complain. Uh, there's not really a lot of alternatives for them. Um, and so I think they're likely to continue to build their security strategies around the United States and try to influence the U.S. to align the U.S. with their positions on these major issues. Thank you. Next, we have uh, a speaker, um, Mr. Michael Buonin from uh, the company uh, Hill International from Middle East Operations. Uh, Michael. Good afternoon. As uh, I've been introduced several times, my name is Michael Bonvino. I am uh, Vice President for Global Development at Hill International. And Hill is a US-based company in fact, we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange with worldwide operations. Our forte is project construction management. We provide significant project risk, cost, construction program, and project management worldwide, and have a very strong presence in the Gulf. Uh, we've been there 27 years. Uh, we went there with four people in the mid-80s. We have 1,500 plus people there now. Our staff comprises of people from 42 countries. We find the GCC a very good place to do business. We found, found uh, friendships, formed relationships, and have maintained a working relationship with intelligent governments and strong clients. We currently have about $80 billion worth of work underway in the GCC and Middle East alone. It's a significant portion of our company's worldwide portfolio. We see no end in sight. We uh, have found some good friendships, some strong relations. I think we'll find the United States presence in the Middle East will be well received if we continue and try to do our best to uh, continue forward with uh, worldwide interests. Uh, the GCC, six countries, all independent, all different all have a different culture, all have a different business practice. Uh, we've, we've prided ourselves really in the scope and scale of the work we've been awarded. It's probably one of the world's most competitive award processes. And uh, I've spent the last six years in Qatar. I've only recently returned to Washington, D.C. to undertake this new task. My background is architecture and master planning. I've worked in uh, most of the North African countries. I've worked in Afghanistan, Jordan, Syria, uh, Egypt, Sudan. Uh, they're all a challenge, and they're all interesting in their own way. And Hill's been through all of those countries. I think in the past 24 months, I've been in 22 countries. So we find that, that in our years of experience, 27 years now totally in the, in the GCC, uh, there have been good times and there's been bad times. We've weathered some of the, of the worst of the storms and, and we're now there and well placed with strong relationships to move forward. And we find that relationships are equally important with competitive economics in the Middle East. Uh, doing what you promise you're going to do, delivering what you promised you were going to deliver and establishing a cultural understanding of the client's expectations and needs has been really important. Again, it is a good place to do business, but it's not an easy place. There's no low-hanging fruit. It's a very intelligent community with a strong cultural sense of where it wants to take itself. 
Uh, I think our focus has been in civils. Over the years, we've probably built more towers and other big structures in the Middle East than any other firm. We also build airports, railways, harbors, uh, water systems. Uh, we're working on some of the largest hospital projects in the world right now. Saudi Arabia has been a very good client for us. Their Ministry of Health is us underway in a lot of the latest thinking in health care and health and science deliveries. So it's a good thing. And a part of this process, we partner. We do local partnering. We do knowledge sharing. We have a tremendous effort we make in, in uh, training. We think it's really important that we involve the client, their engineering staffs, their managerial staffs, and our projects, our project decision making and delivery. We want to make sure that their infrastructure is going to be there for the long haul. But they certainly have invested heavily in it. Qatar. A population of about 200, 250,000 has over 100 billion U.S. dollars in infrastructure projects underway there right now. We have a broad-based spectrum of work we're doing. So I don't have a political agenda. I have a commercial agenda. And I find Hill to be well-placed and happy with our roles and our relationships in the Middle East. Uh, it's not easy. It wasn't easy for me in Afghanistan to leave my family in the U.S. while I went into a very hostile world. But it's been very welcoming in the bulk of the GCC. And I think, uh, I think we're proud to, to be there. We're proud of our relationships. So I don't have these, uh, these deep concerns that I've heard here voiced so often today. I think we really have a, a wonderful partnership with what is a, a newly developing region in the world with a great deal of economic capability and some strong security needs. And I think the U.S. is well placed. We have these debates. If the U.S. is not there, is it the U.K., is it China, is it Russia? Personally, I know what horse I'd want to ride. Um, but I think it's a great place. So, um, I think any company uh, in like Hill who's a you know, we're 4,000 people worldwide. 1,500 of our staff are in the GCC. Four years ago, we were 400. So we've grown quickly. We've grown well. And there's lots of opportunity there. I would encourage American businesses to look at the GCC, encourage our governments and our, our trade relationships to, uh, to become even a bigger voice and a bigger part of what they're doing there. So I'm not Pollyanna, but I do have a very positive view. I have a long history. I, I began working with King Fahd in 1982. Um, I've been in, working in Kuwait, Qatar, the UAE, Yemen, uh, again, uh, Bahrain. Uh, they're all unique. They're all special places. And they all have a great deal of work that yet, has yet to be done. So I, I don't know. Um, about the controversies of much. I've lived there, my family's lived there, my kids have been there with me. Um, it's not the US, but it is the GCC. It's a good place, I think, to, uh, to do business. Uh, I think uh, right now we're, we're involved in a lot of the big infrastructure projects. You know, they have a tremendous need for water systems, for highways, for rail and, and uh, aviation systems. I think we have six airports under construction right now in the Middle East, six commercial airports. I think we're doing two metro systems. We're doing, uh, I've given up count right now. I think we have maybe close to 20 hospitals underway in the Middle East right now. Some of these hospitals are medical cities with populations of over 300,000 people. You know, it's a, remarkable. As a, as a, you know, I'm an architect in the later stages of my youth. I never in my life dreamed that I'd be working on 10 projects at one time with a combined value in excess of 40 or $50 billion. It's remarkable for a guy who was a hired crayon to end up in this world. And Hill's been a proud member of that and a strong part of the US contingent in the Middle East. So I think uh, that's what we're trying to achieve there. And I think uh, we're going to keep at it. I think that's, uh, that's my, my message here today. Thank you, Michael. And lastly, we have uh, Ambassador Richard Schmierer, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Diplomacy at the Bureau of Near East Affairs and former U.S. Ambassador to
to the Sultanate of Oman. Dr. Schmier. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's certainly a pleasure to be here, and I'm very honored to be uh, with such a, a group of distinguished panel members. And particularly thank you to John. I was very pleased to be able to host you and your groups in Oman when you came to our embassy. And so thank you for the opportunity to come back and, and meet with you here. And David, of course, is an old friend uh, from Oman uh, as well. So it's great to be uh, back among friends. I thought I would just speak briefly um, and just quickly try to provide a framework. And actually, many of our colleagues in their remarks have have kind of indicated the kind of framework that we see as at the basis for our engagement with the GCC states. And then from there, maybe just quickly run through some of our current policy issues in the region, just to give you a sense of where we're trying to go. And, and I think we're working very well with our GCC colleagues to, to try to get to those goals. Uh, so I guess the, the, the kind of the framework that I, I would point out uh, is one that I believe that we, the United States, and our GCC uh, friends and allies share the same set of strategic goals for the region. Uh, and so we might differ on tactics. We might have uh, days or periods when we have different views of how to get there. But I think we, we share the same strategic goals uh, for the region. And I'll talk about that uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, at the same time, I think we also have common interests in the region. And so we build our policies on the interests that we share. And I think Mike uh, alluded to that, Ken, uh, as well. Uh, Jason, in, in terms of our commercial, uh, the kinds of things that we work together uh, closely with our GCC uh, friends on. And then finally, I would just mention as part of that framework, and uh, Mike, you kind of alluded to it, but those of us who have lived and worked in the region for a long time are very familiar with what I would call the affinity between our country and the peoples of the region. Uh, the number of people from that region who've studied here, the number of Americans who've gone and worked there, uh, the educational institutions that have been opened up uh, you know, from the United States uh, to the region, the commercial engagement, uh, the broad, broad array of human sort of personal interaction and experience that I think has led to a foundation of affinity between the peoples in the region uh, and, and the United States. And more recently, I recall certainly from my experience in Oman, as the region began to start transforming you know, with the Arab Spring and the Arab Awakening and the other kinds of, of developments, uh, I sense and I believe that there was a strong a sort of interest on the part of the people, particularly the young people, in looking at the kinds of values and principles and, and sort of aspects of the United States that might be helpful for them to try to pursue uh, in their countries to improve their economies, to improve their governments, to develop their civil society, those, those kinds of aspects uh, of their society. So I would cite those as the kind of the framework uh, upon which we sort of work together uh, towards the common goals and the common interests uh, that we have. And so with that, let me just quickly run down so, sort of the key current uh, issues in the region that have been touched on by all of our colleagues. Uh, just to sort of summarize quickly what we are trying to accomplish, and, and I think you'll agree that our GCC allies are seeking to accomplish the same things, even if we have different points of view on uh, some points on how to get there. Uh, on Syria, uh, the, the Secretary, in fact, is in Europe right now uh, talking uh, with the London 11 and others uh, on how to move forward on Syria. Syria has been an incredible tragedy, um, and we have been seeking ways to, to try to foster or force a political solution. Uh, we don't believe that a military solution is the way that this is going to get resolved. So we've been looking for a political solution. The basis for that political solution we see as the Geneva communique of, of the summer of 2012. And that communique basically calls for a transitional government uh, mutually agreed upon by the opposition uh, and the current government, uh, which has full executive powers. And we believe that formula would lead to what we call for, which is the departure of, the, of Assad and his regime and the installation uh, of a new uh, transitional government. So we're aiming to try to bring the parties to the point 
where we can have a, a, another conference in Geneva um, that would move to implement the Geneva communique. And that's what the Secretary has been very hard at work on. At the same time, I think we all have to recognize, and, and as I mentioned, Syria today is a tragedy. The humanitarian uh, situation in, in Geneva uh, is, is just uh, tragic, and we are working with our GCC friends, frankly, to try to provide as much humanitarian assistance to Syrians, both inside uh, and outside the country, as possible. And the, the GCC countries have been very supportive and very generous, Kuwait in particular having hosted a donors conference for uh, the Syrians, and we certainly have appreciated that. Uh, on Egypt, uh, as you know, we're, we're trying to do what we can do to encourage the current interim government in Egypt to implement the roadmap towards a return uh, of an elected uh, government um, as soon as possible with as broad uh, an election and, and as broad participation politically as possible. Um, so we're trying to pursue that goal. I know our GCC colleagues are trying to pursue the same goal. Uh, I think we've had some different points of view as to how to best encourage Egypt to do what it says it wants to do, uh, and so we'll continue having the discussion about how we help them implement the roadmap that they themselves have drawn up and have said they are trying to, to implement. Uh, on Iran, there have been some comments uh, on Iran. Um, certainly, uh, we've made very, very clear that while, yes, there is a new president in Iran, uh, yes, there are some indications of potential movement in our discussions with Iran uh, with, through the P5 plus 1 uh, on the nuclear file, we've made it absolutely clear in every time we've commented on this that it's deeds, not words that we're looking for. And so while we want to encourage the new administration in Iran to be forthcoming and to deliver the deeds that are needed to, to genuinely address the nuclear file, uh, we're not there yet. But we're trying to encourage any element that suggests that there might be a new way to try to get this resolved. There are the other issues with Iran that we are as, as much seized with as the others in the region. The, the dis destabilizing Iranian activities throughout the region are a cause of great concern, and we continue to engage with our allies and in, and in other ways to try to push back against and respond to the destabilizing activities uh, of Iran. Um, I might mention Yemen because Yemen is, to my mind, a bit of a surprising success story. I was in Oman as ambassador when the GCC broker deal finally took hold, and it was a, a long, hard battle, and the GCC ambassadors uh, in Sana'a and also in the GCC uh, leaders in, in their uh, host countries uh, were very determined to help Yemen move towards a, a peaceful transition, and that's what we're watching uh, unfold right now. It continues to be a challenge, uh, but I think the GCC deserves great credit, and we and, and others have been there working with them, but the GCC has had the lead on the great success that is the current process to bring a transitional, uh, to transition uh, Yemen uh, into uh, to a new government while holding the country uh, unified. Uh, another story that I think is, is underreported uh, is Iraq's integration into the Arab region once again. Uh, this has been a tremendously successful year in terms of Iraq, Kuwait, rapprochement, uh, and there are other, other uh, undertakings uh, going on to try to help Iraq improve its ties and its relations with the other uh, members of the GCC uh, states. And so I think that could be a fundamentally positive move towards addressing some of the sectarian concerns, some of the sectarianism uh, that is unfortunately becoming more widespread in some parts of the region. And so we've worked very closely with Iraq and with the GCC to try to move forward uh, Iraq's better integration uh, into that part of the region. And then finally, let me just mention the Middle East peace process. Uh, I think you're aware that the Secretary uh, has just had another meeting uh, with the representatives from the Arab Peace Initiative, uh, and we certainly recognize that among the Arab countries, and in particular the GCC countries, there's a very important role to be played by the, the, those Arab countries and those Arab leaders that are looking to support the effort to finally end the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. And we've seen 
great progress and great courage uh, by GCC leaders and others uh, in the Arab Peace Initiative and in providing support, both sort of rhetorical or political support, but also economic support. The Palestinians do need economic support. They need immediate support, and the GCC countries have been in the forefront of providing that. But they also need longer-term investment and economic development support. And that's going to be a very, very important part of the ability to bring a peace agreement forward, which, en which enables two states to exist, both viable, both successful, both offering bright futures for their people. Uh, they, we need to ensure that the Palestinians uh, do have a viable and, and good economic future. That is going to require a commitment and, and support by the Arab countries, and particularly, as Jason pointed out, many of the resources in that region uh, are from the GCC. So they are playing a very helpful and an important role in the current effort to try to bring about a Middle East peace. So in all of those areas, there may be disagreements from day to day on tactics, on you know, a particular approach or a particular decision. But we're very confident that we and our partners in the GCC share a common vision uh, for the region and, and really share uh, a, a common commitment to trying to help all of these countries and, and the, the region as a whole uh, progress. And so, yes, there's cause for concern when, when there are disagreements on approach, but I, I'm quite confident that our level of diplomatic engagement, as we're witnessing just today uh, with the Secretary meeting with two of the GCC foreign ministers in Europe, that level of engagement is, is really extremely strong and, and I know will continue as we continue to address these extremely difficult uh, issues. So anyway, thank you for giving me the opportunity to look forward to some discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Schmier. The first question actually is for Ambassador Schmier. It says, you mentioned that the Secretariat is working, or the Secretary is working towards bringing the rebels and the regime uh, to a point where they can agree on a new uh, interim government. Um, what about the deep fragmentation among the rebels? And I think the uh, real question is, is how, is, uh, how does the possibility look of, uh, at this point of forming such a, an interim government? Uh, well, certainly that's an, an excellent question because one of the, the challenges, or I guess I would uh, once again say tragedies of the Syrian development, uh, has been that elements of the opposition, uh, as the Assad regime has, uh, has more and more employed violence and, and just done unspeakable things against its own people, uh, it has, that has allowed a, a kind of a window or a development to occur where extremists have now, as, as everyone knows, come in and participated, become part of the conflict. And so that in itself, unfortunately, has, has caused a, diver, a division among those opposed to the Assad regime uh, between those who are genuinely, genuine Syrian uh, supporters, people who want to see a new Syria uh, uh, along the lines of the kind of Syria that the Syrians were demonstrating for in the early days uh, of the uh, Arab uh, Spring, where they were calling for better governance, more, a more moderate, uh, more open society. And now there's a whole element that's in there calling for very much the opposite, uh, an Islamic, uh, much more repressive society. So that has has developed this, this split. Now we're continuing to work very closely with the Syrian opposition coalition uh, and we're encouraging all of our partners who are supporting the opposition to do the same. And, and I, I'm confident that they're generally committed to doing that. So all of those who are working hard in support of the Syrian people for what the Syrian people want are united in supporting the moderate Syrian opposition. Uh, but it's become more difficult because of the extremist uh, elements that are, are there. So it's important that we be clear that we support the opposition that is fighting for the Syria that the Syrian people want. 
Uh, and so if we can get to a Geneva Convention uh, or a, another G Geneva meeting, uh, we, would wanna, we will be supporting the Syrian Opposition Coalition-led delegation that would participate in seeking to put together uh, some kind of an interim government, which would entail the departure of Assad and his regime, but some kind of a government that the, the country could rally behind uh, on an interim <coughs> basis. Well, I have one that's a clarification, an, un uh, an interesting one from a commodore in the uh, Saudi uh, Navy. Uh, just He said to clarify about the 200 Iranian boats, I think, that <laughs> uh, Dr. Katzman mentioned. He said, it did not actually happen. He said, I was at sea at that time, but it was only a radar images problem. <laughs> from, from <laughs> At any rate, things slip into the intelligence, you know, that you never know about. I'm not uh, going to comment on, on the clarification. <laughs> uh, I have another question here. We have a, a, a sort of a definition of the U.S. as the only indispensable power. And this is, term has been used, not so much today, but we heard about it in terms of the being a necessary partner for the GCC states. And uh, I sense that there is a disagreement among some of the uh, people on the panel uh, regarding how indispensable the United States is as, as a, a sort of a key uh, defense ally at this point. And I, I just would like to see if maybe Dr. al Shaji and uh, maybe Dr. Ken Katzman would both comment on that as far as whether there are any real logical alternatives. Dr. Osir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, this is the dilemma. I mean, the United States no longer the, is the indispensable nation as it used to be. I, I would categorize it as uh, dominant but not predominant. This is from a strategic perspective because as what uh, we have witnessed, we, have, we are witnessing now a regression by United States. The world is turning into a multipolar world. Uh, the United States is still, as I said in my uh, talk, still the dominant power in the region and uh, the world, uh, the number one uh, superpower. But the United States, as I said, ha is bogged down with its uh, domestic issues, with its uh, budget cuts. Now the United States has only one aircraft carrier in the Gulf region rather than the usual two because of the budget cuts. The United States talk is talking more about burden sharing with its allies. And probably now we're going to see the uh, United States demanding from China to foot in the bill for Gulf security because China is now number one oil importing country, not the United States. Uh, the options for the United States I did not elaborate in my talk bec uh, for, for the GCC countries are, uh, I agree with my friend uh, Katzman, uh, are limited, not only complaining, as he said, but also, I mean, there is a push now by King Abdullah initiative to have a muscle on the bond of the GCC to transfer the GCC into a more uh, uh, robust coalition to deter the enemy. Uh, they talk about Gulf unity rather than cooperation to, to upgrade the relationship to Gulf unity, to diversify our probably uh, armament. Uh, Prince Bandar, I don't know, today he mentioned that scaling back buying weapons from the United States as a retribution for the United States in action, I don't know. But the options are very limited, but we, we could, as, as, as I stated, uh, have more uh, input regarding uh, Gulf uh, unity, the initiative by King Abdullah uh, of Saudi Arabia, in addition to uh, uh, diversify our, uh, in, a, in a multipolar world where the United States is, uh, wants to have less footprints in the region to have 
also other options, but still, I mean, this is a long way ahead of us. I don't foresee uh, Chinese naval forces or Indian naval forces in our neighborhood in the, in the uh, Gulf uh, anytime soon, but this is something that uh, will be happening down the road. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to? Yeah, I've asked it. Um, every December, the GCC meets, and every time they issue a communique saying we're going to form a unified military and we're unifying the command structure and we're forming a joint force, and where is it? When does it ever happen? Never. Uh, the UAE participated in air operations in Libya. Cutter. They did it because the U.S. was training them. <clears throat> the missile defense network I talked about is finally starting to take some embryonic shape because the U.S. is explaining it and selling the equipment. The idea that the GCC is going to do this on its own is just preposterous. It's preposterous. Uh, so I, I think, you know, the U.S. is absolutely indispensable if the GCC are going to defend themselves. There, there is no way they're going to do this by themselves. There are uh, a number of related uh, questions, uh, some of which are slightly statements. And I'll just read them and uh, ask perhaps uh, uh, Ambassador Schmierer to respond to some of them, uh, and maybe uh, Dr. Al Shaji as well. Um, first, uh, does Prince Bunder have a point? Maybe U.S. and GCC interests do diverge. U.S. has, has interests in democratic reform, not propping up family businesses that call themselves <laughs> countries in the GCC. Well, that's more of a statement. Uh, in terms of U.S. interventionalism or isolationism, I often feel we are damned if we do and damned if we don't. After years of possibly valid complaints over U.S. over-involvement in the Middle East, we are now getting slammed for being not involved enough. What does satisfactory U.S. policy in the Middle East look like to you? That one might be for Dr. Schmier. Uh there are also, um, let's see, this one is, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's fit of passive aggression at the UN achieves nothing. When will the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the GCC stop whining about the US and take more responsibilities for its or their own neighborhood? So it's kind of a, a mixed bag of questions here, but they do deal with both the question of what the proper uh, level of U.S. policy involvement in the, in the GCC area should be, and uh, to some degree where the uh, interests of the GCC and the U.S. may diverge. Dr. Schmier, and then, uh, and then uh, Dr. El Shaji. Well, thanks, David. Um, I, um, I did see what uh, Prince Bandar said. I also saw what the secretary said in response, which was to not accept Prince Bandar's uh, uh, thesis. But um, I think it's, the way I would look at it is what's happening is not that the United States has fewer interests. Uh, I think the global community continues to actually grow smaller and more closely knit. So our interests, like everybody else's interests, continue to become more and more intertwined. But I think what you're seeing in the GCC is a growing capability to participate uh, and to contribute. And as a result, the, the nature of the relationship shifts where we now really are looking for the GCC to help sort of take a lead or, or at least be significant contributors. Uh, Ken mentioned Libya, uh, the Libya example. But uh, in general, uh, they've been significant contributors, as I was pointing out, in a number of the key regional issues that are of great concern to us as well. So I would think, I would say that our interests continue to align very well, um, but uh, the, the ability of the GCC states to bring their resources to play 
is a very important part, particularly as people have pointed out. Uh, the U.S. obviously faces certain constraints in terms of our current sort of economic and other considerations. Uh, and so having strong partners like that uh, is, is of greater interest to us, of greater need to us. The other point was kind of alluded to that I, might be interesting just to, to try to clarify. Um, the U.S., as you know, uh, has certain values and certain principles which it supports and promotes. Um, it always has done so, it always will do so, do so, that's who we are. But under different circumstances, in different places at different times, we take different approaches to, to doing that. We believe all countries would benefit by considering uh, looking at the kinds of principles and values through which we organize our country and our society, because we believe that's a very successful model for doing so. So we want to encourage all countries to continue to do that. Now, some countries, maybe if they've gone through a revolution, are in a position to suddenly, very quickly, adopt a whole series of new principles uh, that we think are helpful to them to succeed going forward. Other countries are going through maybe more reform or more, more gradual transitions. But that's, I think all countries are facing the need to be responsive to their citizens and to be open to ideas of how to make their societies function more efficiently. And we continue to encourage all countries, including the GCC countries and all the other countries in this region and around the world, to look at those values and principles. So uh, in that sense, I don't see that they have one way of doing things, we have another, they have one set of interests, we have another. I think we're all, we all have these as common, common interests and, and we want to work together uh, towards those common goals. Uh, yeah, just, uh, no, thank you. Yeah, just briefly, in any relationship or in any coalition or partnership, the junior partner always has to suffer because of action or inaction by the uh, bigger partner, and that's the United States. The relationship between the GCC and the United States has been and will always be asymmetrical with the United, in the United States' favor. That doesn't mean that we, have, we are whining all the time and we have to, act to get our act together, but we are paying a price of United States miscalculation also. This has to be remembered. Toppling Saddam Hussein and giving the Iranians the upper hand to run Iraq and to dominate the region is because of United States miscalculation. Iran is now having its high day because of United States action. The suffering in Syria because of United States and the West inaction and immoral approach to the Syrian mayhem. The relationship now, as we see it, is that this asymmetrical relationship is now, it's a, it's a one-way street in the United States' favor. The overture towards Iran, from our perspective, to add more to our uh, worries, is, from our perspective, a zero-sum game. We would like it to be a win-win situation for the Americans, for the Iranians, and for the GCC. If you don't listen to your junior partners, then that's your right. But when things get messy and messier, as apparently they will, as Prince Turkey stated, by inaction in Syria, or by overture and uh, detente and rapprochement with Iran and limiting that to the nuclear issue and ignoring or overlooking the other issues, especially the sectarianism that has been on the rise and it's very detrimental to our region and to the GCC and to the United States allies in the Gulf and Israel, then I think everybody will lose. It's going to be a lose-lose situation. So even though the United States is the larger partner here, but that doesn't mean that it should not listen and uh, have a really con uh, take the concern of its junior partners under consideration for all parties to have a win-win situation strategy rather than a zero-sum game as it is now from our perspective. Well, I just, just briefly, um, the, the problem is Rouhani said he wants to be more cooperative. I mean, what, what would you have us do? Would you tell him to take a hike? I mean, I, I, what, we, we can't really tell him to take a high. I mean, he's saying he wants to change. He wants to be more cooperative. A great power, we have to say, okay, we'll give you a chance. We'll listen. We're skeptical, but we'll listen. W what would you have us do? Say no, get lost? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what alternative. 
I didn't get your point. So listen to us. Rouhani, Rouhani is saying he wants to change the relationship. He wants to break out of the isolation. So, I mean, the alternative is to say, no, we don't believe you. Go get lost. We're, we're not, you know, how, how would that play out? That's what I'm asking. No, no, the concern I'm talking about is not Rouhani. Rouhani is an employee with, uh, under, under Khamenei. What Khamenei wants is the, is the concern, and not what Rouhani. Rouhani is, is a front for the regime. I'm not asking, our concern is not talking to Rouhani or giving him the benefit of the doubt. The concern is delimiting the whole argument and the whole rapprochement over the nuclear issue and overlooking all other major issues that are detrimental to our interest and the interest of your allies and the interest of the United States at the, in the long run. No, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying, as a great power, it, it's, it's incumbent on us to not make a distinction between the, Rouhani's elected, he says he wants some change, and so the, the great power sort of has to, has to say, okay, we'll listen, we'll give it a chance. Okay, that's great, but you have to allay the fears of your allies that the whole package, the grand bargain, if there is one, to materialize that will not be limited only to the nuclear, the, to the Iranian nuclear program, period, but to other issues related to the concern that I stated in the region that Iran has been meddling in our affairs and destabilizing your allies from the Gulf to the Mediterranean. Uh, David has asked me if I'd wrap it up. Um, I, I'd just like to make uh, the following points, just to add to our knowledge and our understanding and a degree of specificity of detail <coughs> about um, a, a key incidents in the relationship between the United States and these countries that have not come out in the deliberations or the questions and answers uh, thus far. Uh, the six GCC countries with the minor modification by Kuwait <clears throat> remain wedded to the American dollar as the instrument of denominating their exports. Now they could have demanded uh, that uh, the United States taking from them what the United States purchases in the way of goods, pay them in their own currency. Uh, that would be their right, their national sovereign right, but they uh, have not done that and it uh, would actually fly in the face of harsh economic realities about the role of the dollar in uh, global finance. But that they have stayed with the dollar through thick and thin uh, has not um, all been successful. They have taken hits by doing this. Uh, Kuwait's idea conceptually uh, have a basket of currencies there that would fluctuate, um, this would uh, be protective. And the, and the Kuwaiti population demanded that. And so uh, there's that aspect that the others haven't followed Kuwait's lead. Uh, translates into a net benefit for the United States, but not necessarily a net benefit for the GCC ministries of finance uh, across the board. Uh, secondly, uh, this support for the dollar helps to perpetuate the ongoing preeminence of the American financial system, banking system, worldwide. That's no small thing. Uh, I remember being in uh, Bahrain in 19, or 2002, a year before the U.S.-led invasion, when Saddam Hussein, I think on a Thursday, declared that uh, henceforth Iraq's oil uh, exports would be denominated in euros. And boy, did all hell break loose in financial circles, so much so that on Monday he reversed himself and uh, said, no, well, we'll stick with the American dollar there. Uh, in 2008, uh, Patrick Mancino and I were in uh, Abu Dhabi, and I was asked to address the International Press Corps and the International Diplomatic Corps. This was November the 2nd. The American election was November the 8th, I think, and they wanted to know what the implications would be for U.S. Uh, Arab, U.S. Muslim, U.S. GCC relations, regardless of whoever um, uh, won the election. That was a, a bit of a formidable task. But what they said 
was that, you know, within the last month, the uh, number two person in the U.S. Treasury came here to Kuwait, to Qatar, to Saudi Arabia, to Abu Dhabi with, uh, in effect, begging bowl in hand because the U.S. mortgage crisis, the liquidity crisis, the financial crisis, the employment crisis, the Wall Street crisis had all uh, shown that here it comes and uh, aspects of it uh, were in place. The U.S. had come asking, in essence, uh, hey, fine fella, would you spare me a dime? Uh, and the reaction for the first time, uh, told to me by ministers of finance in the region, was, uh, I'll clean up my language here, look, goddammit, we're tired of uh, being with you on uh, the uh, crash uh, that has been generated by something on your policies or positions or actions or attitudes. Uh, we are really fed up with that and we want to be with you on the takeoff from now on. And so the G20, in part, uh, came as a result of that persuasive point being conveyed. And uh, Saudi Arabia is a member of the G20, but it also represents the other five GCC countries. So um, uh, that's been significant uh, in terms of uh, a maturity of the relationship and trying to level an aspect of the playing field. And, and not being abusive and looking at the GCC as, uh, as objects uh, uh, um, more than actors with their own legitimate rights, their own legitimate needs, their own legitimate concerns, their own legitimate interests, their own legitimate foreign policy uh, objectives. So that's uh, changed the situation uh, quite profoundly there. And then there is something, a bedrock, uh, that's more than 100 years old that has provided a base of goodwill towards Americans that uh, not maybe the majority in this audience is aware of, and that is the work primarily of the Dutch Reformed Church of America and what it did in southern Iraq and what it did in Bahrain and what it did in Oman uh, there. And in Kuwait in particular, the Kuwait foreign minister used to say the United States has, has liberated us twice. And people would think, well, when was the first one? And he harkens back to when American doctors and nurses came to Kuwait to rid the country of smallpox a uh, hundred years ago at this time there. And this was before oil. This was before air conditioning. They didn't go to convert or to proselytize. Uh, they went to do good deeds. And they, they built up this kind of relationship or image or perception versus a colonial power as, as such. Um, with regard to uh, Oman, in particular, the, the father of David Bosch was for years the sole surgeon, not just the sole American surgeon in the country, but the sole surgeon when the country had only six miles Americans uh, did this in Oman. And when I first went there with my wife in uh, the summer of 1971, there was no motel, no hotel, no pension, no guest house. And um, uh, only the 48 lepers uh, took my wife in uh, uh, there. And we lived with the lepers for a month. But the lepers camped out behind the Mustafa Rahma uh, Mercy Hotel in, in, in Matra there. So uh, this uh, memory of uh, that part of the United States has helped to soften some of the edges or give the U.S. the benefit of the doubt in a few ways. And then when the uh, Egyptians ultimately sent 80,000 troops to uh, Yemen when it supported the overthrow of the monarchy there, uh, the fear of Saudi Arabia, which was legitimate that uh, Saudi Arabia was next, indeed, uh, Egypt flew flights into Saudi Arabia, uh, dropped napalm uh, on the border areas around Najran. Well, the United States flew patterns up and down the Red Sea to confuse the uh, Egyptian army, in essence, to send a message, don't you dare go any further. And so that act of deterrence and containment uh, deepened the trust and, and the bonds uh, at, at that time. Admittedly, they're being frayed and tried, but they've been anchored and tested now for more than uh, 70 years. And in terms of Oman again, during the Iran-Iraq war, when the tanker war began, uh, there's a former American ambassador to uh, Oman who says, 
Oman saved the lives of 33 American pilots uh, who otherwise would have had to ditch in the sea and drowned. But Oman beckoned them uh, to come to Oman and land uh, safely uh, there. And in Bahrain in 1983, when the USS Stark was bombed by Iraq, I think in May, um, but for the Bahraini uh, Navy and search and rescue uh, teams, uh, no telling how many Americans would have drowned. And the emir actually went into the hospitals, to the bedrooms of the Americans who survived that particular attack. These are small things, but uh, as the song says, little things uh, uh, mean a lot. Um, and then lastly, at the people-to-people -people level, uh, I would invite anybody's guess. I think it's a conservative figure that some 300,000 GCC nationals have received their higher education in the United States except for uh, maybe 50 members of the Nation of Islam in the United States based in Chicago that have gone to study at the Islamic University in Medina and Umar Kura University in Mecca. I'm not aware of a single American who's graduated from any GCC university. So you've got this enormous asymmetry in terms of feelings and uh, experiences and an uh, understanding of one another. But the, the greater misunderstanding, I believe, is on our side. Uh, and it's partly ling linguistic, it's partly cultural, it's partly education, as I've just alluded to. But we're trying to make amends with that, uh, with Jason Buttonings talking about our finally taking seriously all six of the GCC countries and realizing we can't protect this relationship, let alone strengthen it, let alone expand it, let alone diversify it by accident. It's not an automatic pilot. Uh, he and others at this table are working to make that happen. And Abdullah Shaheji's tone is to be taken seriously there of the senior partner uh, needing to take into consideration empathetically putting uh, the big partners' uh, shoes and soles and situations inside of the junior party uh, partners and needs and concerns.